All right, Dr. Rashid, I think we can start if you'd like. Okay, wonderful. So um, we are today going to go over the um, latest updates on the adult anti-seizure medications. Um, I'm Dr. Rashid and I'm uh, in Encinitas, California, and very excited to be here today. Um, appreciate the opportunity to share my experience and knowledge about the treatment of adults uh, with epilepsy, uh, particularly uh, focusing on adults with refractory or difficult to treat epilepsy. Uh, a lot of these drugs that I'm going to discuss are also indicated for pediatrics, so there's definitely overlap. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So as a lot of you know, uncontrolled epilepsy is still in unmet need. We have 70 million people worldwide, about three and a half million in the US. And we have seen over time that despite the availability um, of over 20 anti-seizure medications or ASMs uh, in studies, um, in the studies that we use as, as doctors and epileptologists, um, that have been over time repeated. We see that about one third of patients with epilepsy have seizures refractory to pharmacotherapy. However, you know, fairly recently, the Centers for Disease Control data indicates that about 56% of patients are still having seizures despite seizure med medication. And we'll go over that in more detail. But that's definitely a concern for us as epileptologists, that there may be more than 30% of patients out there that are having seizures and, and desperately need our help. So what is medically refractory epilepsy? So the studies that we've looked at um, you know, are, are done in a retrospective fashion where, where things are looked at um, in the past. And what we've seen from some of the finest studies that have been done, even published in the New England Journal of Medicine, that really what predicts, almost predicts that somebody will do well on seizure medication is that they become seizure free on their first anti-epileptic drug, right? Um, the, the, and 47% of patients have, you know, in retrospective data been seen to respond to the first one. The second drug, if that first one doesn't work, then you, you have about, you know, 14% of patients may respond. But then you end up with these, you know, unfortunately, with patients, you know, that, that may not respond to that second drug, and you have to try a third one. And many times now it's polytherapy anymore now, you know, more than one drug. And we don't have a chance to say, okay, let's just try a third drug by itself. And, and at that point, we're, we're way below 10%, uh, we're at 3%. So on average, in the studies that have been done in this manner, uh, th about 36% of patients just don't get seizure free. Advance to the next, okay. So when, when we started to see the CDC data, uh, we were more concerned because what we what we saw, you know, was that the CDC analyzed data from um, 2013 and 2015. Um, they did some national health interview surveys uh, where they went door to door to find out, you know, people with seizures um, that were, you know, had they had seizures in the past year. And uh, it's, it's, you know, from that, those studies, it showed that although 90% of the adults with active epilepsy were actually taking medication for epilepsy, less than half of those were seizure free in the past year. So, so what does that mean? That means that they, they've had at least one seizure in the past year. And, and so, you know, regardless, and this graph shows, have they seen a specialist in the past year or not, right? And, uh, 
And it shows that regardless of, of seeing a specialist, in some cases, these patients were still having seizures. And we also were able to sub-analyze data that, that seizures were more common among persons with lower household income, the unemployed, the divorced, separated, or widowed. So unfortunately, you know, in, in cases where patients may not have access to, you know, being able to be more compliant with care, you know, we may be able to, to understand that from, from that, those results. Um, or are those patients predisposed to having more seizures? It's hard to completely understand the whole picture. Are those the sicker patients that actually, you know, they can't achieve the higher household income, they can't have relationships? Or is it, you know, that, that um, those patients don't have the ability to maintain uh, compliance with their medications, right? So there are a lot of ways to look at that. So what are, what are the consequences? So this is what we really worry about as healthcare providers, as doctors, um, as epileptologists. Uh, you know, we worry that, that uncontrolled epilepsy is a serious problem. I mean, it's, 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 it's a truly, you know, concern about premature death, a sudden unexplained death with epilepsy or SUDEP. Uh, that's a huge concern of ours. It's always in the back of our minds uh, when we're talking to a patient. Um, it's it's something that we we hope that we never have to um, you know seriously consider in a patient or or experience with one of our patients. So that is is a a reason that uh, you know I'm especially an advocate of of getting things started, getting the process going, getting you know, the right medications, the right treatments to the patients as soon as possible. Um, the other concern is injuries. I mean, there have been many patients in, in my past, unfortunately, who've, who've had injuries. And those aren't injuries during a big convulsive seizure necessarily. Those are injuries that can happen during what we call a focal seizure with, with loss of awareness where, um, you know, before used to be called complex partial seizures, um, where the patient just loses some awareness, they may just stare off and somebody that doesn't know that person well may not even know they're having a seizure. Um, it may be just a very brief episode, but in that time, if they're cooking, they can get severe burns. Um, they may fall, they may hit their head somewhere if they're in the shower and there's water, um, you know, in the clogged up water and they end up face down. I mean, those are just really big concerns that we have of any seizure type. Um, psychosocial dysfunction, you know, we know from studies uh, that, that patients with epilepsy have a, a harder time in this, in the world, in, in their social functioning, um, with anxiety, depression, they deal with a lot of of the psychiatric consequences of seizures and epilepsy. They also have a harder time with relationships, with having normal social lives. Um, you know, it it goes back. I can give you an example of a a, a young lady that I used to take care of. She had a brain tumor and um, she developed seizures due to that. Uh, although the brain tumor was resected and she was in remission and it was not likely to ever occur again, she did continue to have seizures because around that area of the brain, there was, there was some dysfunctional um, cortex left. And, and she was a very outgoing, um, beautiful young lady, uh, but her friends didn't really want to spend too much time with her because everybody was always afraid she'll have a seizure. Uh, they didn't really want to invite her to late night social events because they were, you know, scared. And it was it was hard on her. So just to give you one example, um, although the examples can go to the extremes, right? Where patients actually, their employer doesn't want them anymore because they're afraid they'll have a seizure on the job and the employer doesn't want the liability, almost, although that patient is an excellent worker. So 
you know, thus reduce quality of life. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult reality to live with. And so my, our goal, my goal is to, how do we get you back to doing the things that you like to do safely, get your quality of life back. And, you know, there are times where it's, it's really tough, but working together and having the commitment to continue to strive for the best. I mean, we have had amazing results with people's quality of life. And um, I, will, I will give you an example um, as we go on uh, to the medications. So what's the time warp? I think the time warp is, is, is shocking. And I'm glad that I wasn't practicing epilepsy during that time warp because that would have been very depressing. But, but you know, there were epileptologists practicing and then they made it through. But just so that we today appreciate what happened, you know, two and a half decades ago, there was a limited choice of anti-seizure medications. Um, in August 1993 in the United States, the first new anti-seizure medicine was approved in approximately 15 years um, and, and approved by the US FDA. So since then, you know, it's, it's been great. We've got numerous anti-seizure medications. The, the good thing is that not only do we have a lot more, but now we're looking at new drug classes, different mechanisms of action that have never been seen before. Um, and most of those have, um, you know, some of those uh, have pharmacokinetic properties that are really different from those of older anti-seizure medications. And for example, you know, some of these newer medications don't require levels. You know, with the older medications, there was a lot of emphasis on levels because there was, there were definitely windows of what's therapeutic and what becomes toxic. And there were some limited mechanisms of action, but now we have some, some novel mechanisms of action. And from my experience, I think some of the newer anti-epileptic medications are definitely more easy to tolerate for the patient. So I think good things are, are here, better things are headed our way, and we have a lot of hope for the future. So just to, to show you a diagram here about the last, you know, um, you know, I guess since the 1930s, right, uh, when, when phenytoin was really it, um, but, but as, as time went on, you know, and, and to the present, um, there are a couple that aren't on here that just got approved as well, um, and those are, um, you know, the uh, uh, nasal um, abortive drugs. Uh, and we'll go through those as well. Um, but now you just see that you see this ladder that just just really shoots off, you know, um, in the in the late, you know, um, sorry, in the early uh, 90s. So, uh, you know, good things have have come our way and, and better things are, are on the horizon for sure. So, you know, with all good things, you know, there can be dilemmas, right? So what's the dilemma? Now that more than 30 anti-seizure medications are available, you know, sometimes it becomes a challenge. And when, you know, you are looking at a patient, you have to now start to think, what can I offer this patient, right? So it's, it's epileptologists have to think that way, but, but general neurologists, uh, pharmacists, nurses, trainees, other healthcare professionals, they have to be able to figure out pretty quickly how to get a patient on a, on a medication, especially new medications. What side effects do they have? How, what drug-drug interactions do they have? Sometimes it's just a matter of looking things up, talking to a colleague maybe, um, you know, and just just having to really figure that out. And as we become more familiar with the newer medications, of course it becomes easier, but again, every patient is an individual. You know, you don't, you, we don't have a, an exact um, algorithm for every single person. You know, that first we start this and then we start that. Every single person is an individual. Sometimes there are certain side effects that may preclude you from using an anti-epileptic drug for a certain person. Um, and I can certainly give you an example of that. 
I had um, a patient who um, I was interested in starting Clobazam or on fee on, and he was uh, 275 pounds um, and he was in his early 20s. So unfortunately, very overweight, um, developmentally delayed um, um, young man. And uh, he had severe seizures um, that were generalized in onset. And we had tried several medications and his mother was not willing to take the chance of starting that medication because there is a 10% chance of weight gain. Have I seen significant weight gain with the, with the drug and what could I tell the mother? I could tell the mother that in some cases I have seen significant weight gain and had to take patients off. In the majority of cases, I have not seen that. So to, to the mother, that was a big fear. And so we could not we could not start that medication. So you understand now that we have to look at the entire patient. We have to look at, you know, their background, their history, their caregivers, um, their comorbidities before we, we select a medication. So let's review some of the, the newer anti-seizure medications. And just like I said, novel mechanisms, I'm extremely excited about that. And just because it says pediatric doesn't mean it works well for adults. Just because it says adults doesn't mean it doesn't work well for pediatrics in the indicated FDA indicated cases. So we'll start off with Sinobamate, um, also known as Excopri, the drug name. And that was FDA approved in 2019, uh, became available in the market just back in May and it's for partial onset seizures in adults. And it's once a day dosing. And when we talk about dosing, what I know about dosing is that when things are once a day, it's a lot easier for the patient to take the medication to be compliant to because they remember once a day. And as things become twice a day, three times a day, it gets a little harder. But now with phones and alarms and all of that and, and pill boxes, the majority of my patients are, are great at taking medication twice a day, but three times a day, definitely there are patients who can do it. But optimally having a medication that's a once a day dosing is, is a huge bonus. How does it work? So not to get too much into mechanisms of action, but just an overview. Um, in, it enhances the, the sodium current channels, right? Um, the inactivation of sodium channels. Um, and so sodium channels can make the brain hyperexcitable, right? They, they basically cause an action potential that make those neurons fire. So to ha have a, a way to um, inactivate those, um, and there are different types of channels, but, um, uh, but to have a way to inactivate the sodium channels uh, in a rapid and slow inactivation um, is definitely a very effective mechanism for, for epilepsy medications. Um, it inhibits the persistent sodium channel current, so really helps to stop that from, from refiring. And it also helps to, to modulate GABA, um, A ion channels, and GABA is, is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So it helps to calm the brain down. And so with the GABA channel being, being modulated in a, in a nice way by this, this medication, it helps to, to keep things calm, right? So we have two things going. We're trying to block the, the excitable current and we're trying to enhance the calmer effect, right? Um, and the, the data have been amazing for this medication. 21% um, just the seizure freedom rate. A lot of times with medications, you don't get a very high seizure freedom rate when you look at the data. You know, 5%, 10% um, of patients became seizure free. When you see a medication that has such a high seizure freedom rate, um, you, you know that it's going to be very effective for a large majority of patients uh, that that don't, you know, that, that may just need a touch of the medication, a little more than, you know, a little less than 400 or, or up to 400, that we have higher chances of getting patients seizure-free. 
So, so that is a, a huge benefit of ex copri. And then, you know, when you look at what are the, you know, things that, that, that we, you know, may have to, you know, worry about, uh, one of the things we have to be cautious about is that it is a slow titration. And so when an epileptologist sees a patient for the first time and the patient has had, you know, new onset seizures, you know, at that point, we may not be able to say right away that, that we're going to start this medication. Let's get you on something quickly and then slowly titrate up on the excopri. So everybody has a different way to approach things. But with excopri, we do have to go low and slow. Uh, but, you know, we start to see an effect, uh, you know, about by in, in, in one of my patients, even by 50 milligrams a day, uh, but, but generally by 100 milligrams a day. Um, so, you know, within a few weeks, you will start to see an effect. But again, you know, you have to weigh the risks and benefits of starting a medication that's slow. And there have been other medications in the past that have also been low and slow. And, and sometimes all it takes is just making sure that patients on something to protect them in the meantime, while you titrate up that other medication. So Brivaracetam or Briviact um, is, is a, also a, a newer medication. It's a new monotherapy treatment option for epilepsy patients 16 years of age and older. And it is for partial onset or focal seizures. Um, and, you know, the, the big point about Briviact or Rivaracetam was that it can be initiated at a therapeutic dose at day one. And so that was very exciting for, for healthcare prov providers, for patients, uh, patients' families that, you know, on day one, really, you know, we can get to a therapeutic dose, right? But as, as we practice and we figure out how is, is the therapeutic dose on day one tolerated, we, we start to tweak things according to our clinical experiences. So in my case, I did see that some patients could tolerate the 50 milligrams twice a day, uh, right away. But in other cases, patients had to be started a little slower, like half a tablet twice a day. So we didn't really get to the therapeutic dose at day one. And then there's a high, there are higher doses, 75 milligrams twice a day, 100 milligrams twice a day. I certainly had patients that were, you know, that the 100 milligrams twice a day was beneficial for them, um, but I um, couldn't start them at that obviously on day one. So with experience, we, we figure out what works better for patients. And then again, every patient's an individual. What well, one tolerates, another may not. And what works for one may not work for another. And I'm sure all of you are, are aware of that. The mechanism you know, of action um, is a, a high and selective affinity for SV2A. It's a synaptic vesicle protein 2A. And basically that, that is, helps to modulate the release of neurotransmitters in the synapse uh, you know, between nerve cells. So between nerve cells, if you dump a lot of excitatory um, substances, those the next nerve cell is going to fire away, right? So when something binds to SV2A, it helps to stop that, that excitatory dumping and, and helps to calm the brain down. So what was the big, big point about Brivaracetam? Because the company that made Levetiracetam made Brivaracetam. And basically what was told uh, and demonstrated in their animal models was a higher affinity for binding um, of that um, synaptic vesicle protein 2A um, than levetiracetam by approximately 15 to 30 times. Does that mean it works better than levetiracetam? In the clinical world, in the real world, and in seeing lots and lots of patients, not necessarily. Again, every patient is different. Why would you use this over levetiracetam if levetiracetam is working super well in someone? The only reason I would use it is when somebody may have had a mood side effect to levetiracetam, which can happen, anxiety, depression. This medication in many cases worked just as well 
as levetiracetam without those mood side effects. And then at the end of my talk, we'll, we'll talk about mood side effects more with all of our seizure medications. It's, it's a possibility. Uh, but I think that, you know, when, when medications come out and you know what their mechanisms are and you see what the animal models show, again, we're not in the real world until we really start to use those medications and we see what, what works well for patients and how patients tolerate medications well. And coming from an adult epileptologist perspective, Tolerance of medications is huge for adults. A lot of my adults work, you know, they have children, um, they, have, they have busy lives. Um, you know, some of them are delayed and, and, and don't work as much, but definitely have a desire to be out there in the community and doing things and maybe having some kind of part-time job. Um, you know, so between those and then the highly functional people who, you know, have a, a full-time job and, and children and, 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 you know, finances and budget, you know, budgets to worry about, you know, it's tolerating a medication is huge because you can't let a medication get you down for the entire day, right? So cannabidiol, there's been a lot of talk about that and I'm sure in the other presentations you're hearing a lot about the cannabidiol. Um, you know, we, we know that, that it's indicated for patients one, one year and older, right? The, for the tuber sclerosis, lennox gesto drave syndrome, the really severe epilepsies of childhood. Um, and, and I certainly have had a, adults with, with tuber sclerosis and lennox gesto um, but you know, for, for my purposes, when the ability to approve with insurances, why not for adult focal epilepsy, right? So that's, that's definitely something out of my experience, but not FDA approved. Um, but like I said, you know, there are, there are medications that have certain certain FDA approvals that can also be translated to the adult world. So I have certainly appreciated having this as an option for my adults because some of my adults want to try a more natural, um, and, and you have to remember, you know, natural still is, it is still a medication, right? It is still um, something that can have side effects um, and, and def def definitely needs to be dosed appropriately. Um, what was exciting about cannabidiol was that, you know, Epidiolex, um, the only, you know, uh, first and only um, FDA approved cannabidiol for epilepsy, um, it's, it's unusual, right? Um, it's, we don't have any other um, anti-epileptic that's, that's quite, quite like this coming out of a, you know, a, a cannabis plant. Um, you know, and with this, with, you know, liquid formulation, um, it is a weight-based dosing. Uh, and certainly, you know, it's, it's become, gained a wide popularity as, as a lot of you um, are aware. So Clobazam or Onfi was approved in Europe in the 1970s. There was a big time gap then, and it became approved in the U.S. in 2011. I can't get over it. I just can't get over it. Every medical student, every resident, every epilepsy fellow has to hear this from me, that there's this big gap here because these other countries enjoyed the use of this medication from the 1970s, but we had to wait till 2011. And again, in, in the United States, it is indicated for the adjunctive treatment of seizures associated with lennox gesto syndrome in patients two years of age or older. So what is clobazam? It's a benzodiazepine. And so benzodiazepines work on GABA receptors. Remember, we spoke about GABA receptors and how they can help to calm down the nervous system. So they've been used for decades, benzodiazepines of all kinds. Xanax is an example, right? That everybody's aware of. Um, used for decades in the treatment of many ailments, anxiety, insomnia, 
panic disorders, you know, social phobias, you name it, you know, alcohol withdrawal syndromes, you know, it's used for patients who are alcoholic who end up in the hospital to actually prevent a lot of the side effects of alcohol withdrawal, including seizures, right? Um, it is, you know, benzodiazepines are the number one indicated anti-seizure medicine in, in cases of status epilepticus when the patient ends up with a nonstop seizure that goes on for 20 minutes or longer or several seizures in a row without return to baseline. It is the number one drug that you that anybody would get in an emergency room setting or by EMS uh, on transport um, and also at home, you know, and we'll certainly talk about benzodiazepines at home. But to, to prevent a status epilepticus, it's the number one drug. Um, spasticity, even patients without epilepsy that have spasticity, right? Um, and in some cases for sedation. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I've seen over time psychiatrists using little doses of benzodiazepines to help patients sleep. Um, I'm not making any judgments. I don't know if I agree with that practice, but again, I'm not a psychiatrist. But there are, you know, def definitely they have anxiolytic effects. They, they help people sleep. Um, you know, and as you can see, benzodiazepines have been an important part of treatments for many kinds of ailments. So how is, how is Onfi a little, or Clobazam different from other benzodiazepines, right? Other benzodiazepines may have, you know, and not to get into chemistry, but uh, to have nitrogen um, atoms at different positions, right? And the way that, that clobazam was formulated, the nitrogen atoms are, are at different positions so that we would have less sedation and negative, uh, fewer negative side effects um, with this than with some of the other um, benzodiazepines. And so my experience um, with adults has been extensive uh, with clobazam. And, uh, and I'll give you an example. Um, I had an adult uh, patient that was, um, you know, in his 50s and um, had been having seizures since he was about 18 and not seizure, contr not controlled on three excellent doses of medications um, of the latest stuff. I mean, great medications, you know, just not controlled. And so he couldn't live his life properly. He he was brought to me by his new new girlfriend. Um, you know, and now remember he's in his fifties and he's never been married because he's afraid to, to, to share his life with someone and, and have them possibly take care of him. But in the meantime, he was independent. He had, you know, uh, was well doing well in his life, working, um, you know, having a good income. Um, so uh, this lady brought him uh, to me and, and said that we, we want a second opinion. And, uh, I looked at him and, and at that point, you know, this was about two years ago. And I said, well, you know, we, we did a workup for surgery. He was not a surgical candidate. And uh, I said, well, let's, let's try Clobazam. And, and he had never heard of the medication. And then I said to him, a lot of times adult epileptologists uh, may not consider it, it as first line for an, an adult who doesn't have Lennox Gasto or, um, you know, or an adult period, but let's, let's try that because I think you're going to tolerate it well. Uh, you know, you worry sometimes that you don't sleep well, you know, actually it, it can be sedating, especially, um, you know, and I, I dose it all at bedtime. So he became seizure free and he had never been seizure free in his life. And that was a sustained seizure freedom. You know, um, he didn't, didn't, lapse back into having seizures again. He was able to get married. Um, it was a life changer uh, for him and for his, his new wife. And uh, basically he said that, that um, he had never ever thought that he was gonna get to this point in his lifetime. So again, approved in Europe in the 1970s, approved in the US in 2011. So we, you know, again, um, Things are coming our way. They're and they're better and better. And uh, we we have to have hope and we have to keep working together. Next one is parampanel that I'd like to talk about. And the reason I want to talk about parampanel is because it's got a mechanism of action that that other drugs don't have. Um, one of them may have a partial role role with this, but but in in the majority of cases, 
there, this is not a mechanism of action that's been reproduced um, in, in other drugs. And it is indicated in patients with epilepsy age four um, years and older for partial onset or focal onset seizures um, that, that may or may not generalize. Um, and also adjunctive um, therapy for patients 12 and older for generalized onset seizures. So some of our drugs that I've just spoken about have been indicated for focal onset seizures that start in one part of the brain, but now we're talking about seizures that start in a generalized um, fashion. And in some cases, generalized epilepsies are easier to control than the focal epilepsies, but we have definitely seen cases, many, many, many cases over the years because seeing refractory epilepsy patients where these patients are extremely refractory to, to medications. And, and Ficomba or Parampanel has offered some of these patients incredible seizure control. However, there is a black box warning of serious psychiatric and behavioral reactions, including um, homicidality. So prescribers and, and myself, um, you know, are cautious when we prescribe parampanel to a patient. Um, how does it work? It's the first and only non-competitive AMPA receptor antagonist. So AMPA uh, receptors um, basically um, uh, promote the excitatory glutamate um, neurotransmitter. Um, and so that basically blocks that receptor so that that glutamate can't bind to the receptor and excite that cell. So now we've got, you know, um, we've got this medication and I'll give you some examples. I, I had, um, you know, of unfortunate side effects. I had a, a patient who was doing very well in the medication. He came to me, he had been started by another doctor on the medication and he came to me because he was doing really well from a seizure standpoint, but he and his wife were not getting along anymore. And he told me that it was not going to be the, that was going to be the end of his marriage if, if he didn't get off this. He, he had the insight to understand that um, because he knew that he was a different person on the medication. So unfortunately, although it was working really well for him, um, we had to wean him off and get him onto something else. Um, I had a young lady who um, became pregnant, uh, you know, very early in her life at age 18 and had a child, um, you know, she did, she wasn't married to her um, significant other. So her mother ended up taking care of that child because this young lady had, had bad seizures and they were generalized and onset. And she even had a VNS. We, you know, she was on multiple medications. We tried a lot of things. She actually didn't tolerate many medications, but we got her on Ficompa and she was doing extremely well, except that she became very aggressive. And she was, and the mother, this, this girl's mother was really the one who came to me and said, I take care of her child. And, and on top of all that, this girl is extremely aggressive and angry and towards towards me. And she's not the same person that she was since we put her on Ficompa. So unfortunately, again, had to take her off it. So I, th those side effects are real, you know, and, and in some cases they don't happen. And in some cases they do. And when they happen, we have to take action. So just because a medication, and this is not the first time in my career that this happened, just because a medication is working for a patient, if the side effects are enough to disrupt that patient's life, lives, we have to take action. You know, we can't say to that patient, well, you're seizure free, so you're gonna have to deal with the side effect. I mean, I've heard patient stories before of being told that, and, and that is not something that patients should ever have to live with is a decreased quality of life, you know, because they have, um, you know, to stay on a medication. So, you know, again, we have to weigh the pros and cons, but, but you know, that definitely an issue that, again, epilepsy care is tailored to the patient. It's not a, a general algorithm. So I'm going to start to wrap up my talk, but there are a couple of more things I'll go over. Um, Lacosamide or Vimpat um, 
is another medication. It's indicated for monotherapy or adjunctive um, treatment for partial onset seizures in patients four years of age and older. Again, we have some novel mechanisms of action, selectively enhances slow inactivation of sodium channels and also interacts with this CRMP2, collapsin response mediator protein 2. Not entirely sure how that has an anti-epileptic effect, but very excited that we're getting to new mechanisms of action. Um, easy to work with. Um, again, you know, there is a titration period like with, with uh, you know, the majority of our medications, um, but had, had some good results with this as well. What about aborting seizures or cluster seizures, right? So sometimes patients have really severe seizures that have to get aborted right away, um, or they have one after another. And we know that cluster seizures are associated with three times higher mortality rate. And now, you know, for, you know, since since forever practically, all we've known as diastat, right? Since the beginning of my career, I've known um, about diastat, rectal diazepam. And then we can shoot in the dark with oral benzodiazepines that aren't always effective. And how do you put uh, something in somebody's mouth when they're seizing and they're clenched down, right? But now with these easy sprays, intranasal midazolam, nasolam, and intranasal diazepam, Valtoco, it's a game changer. And just to demonstrate Valtoco, you know, um, intranasal diazepam, it's, it's easy to tolerate, it's effective, it's a reliable dose, it goes in the, in the nose. Um, you know, patients have had uh, minimal, if any, um, side effects uh, for, with that, and, and it works. I mean, it's, it's something that can be used in all situations. So I think we've, we've talked a bit through this talk about which is the best seizure medication for a patient. What is the best seizure medication for a patient? I think, you know, through this talk, I've, I've more or less told you that every patient is, an, is, is new for me. Every patient is a new patient. I have to see what, you know, who, who the patient is. What, are, what is the side effect profile of the medications? What else have they been on in the past? What are their other comorbidities? Is it a woman of childbearing age or a woman who might consider, um, you know, as she gets older, having children? Um, you know, some, sometimes people say they don't want children at this time, but, but is it possible she could get pregnant? You know, those are definitely all questions in our minds when we're considering what to put a patient on. It's always an individual decision between me and the patient, patient's family. We talk things through. It's also just so that you know, there, there aren't really head-to-head -head comparative data available um, that, that establish one drug is better than the other. So we don't have those kind of trials out there where let's put this one against that one and see which one's the best. Um, again, everybody's different. What, what one patient's brain will respond to, another patient's brain may not. Well, one person's brain may tolerate, another person's brain may not. So again, it's sometimes trial and error. And in my lifetime, I hope that we can get to the point where we know when a patient walks into our room, just based on the patient's history and what medications they've been, what's going to work. You know, and I would love that day to happen because, you know, sometimes it's a process and we just have to be patient through it. Precautions, and I just want to mention these, and, I, and I'm sure that patients and families are aware that all anti-seizure medicines do have an elevated risk of suicidal ideation behavior, increased risk of teratogenesis. So we have to keep that in mind. Do I worry about that constantly? No. Do I think that the majority of my patients become suicidal or depressed on the medication? No, I don't. Um, I'm very careful about which drugs I put women of childbearing age on, even if they, they say they're not ever going to have children. Um, we, you know, if, if women do become pregnant while taking anti-seizure medi medications, uh, 
you know, we encourage them to enroll themselves with the North American Anti-Epileptic Drug Pregnancy Registry. Important for us to have that data and to understand uh, what happens with the medications. Um, and of course, any adverse events um, can be reported to the FDA. Um, and obviously your prescriber needs to know right away as well. Any questions? Oh, yes, there's lots of them for you, oh, Dr. Rashid. Yay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I love very, <laughs> very <laughs> thorough. So, um, <laughs> so I'll start reading them off, but I do want to make sure that everybody that is on, if you have any more questions, please start typing them in. We have about 10 minutes left before our next speaker jumps on. So let's dive right into it. Uh, from Jennifer, I am on two medications and also have RNS. Seizures are somewhat better, but still bad. Is it truly better to get another type of brain surgery? My doctor said it's hard to truly pinpoint where exactly my seizures are coming from. Is it really better to try to push for a different surgery? Do more studies with my doctor to find exactly where they are coming from and push for a more invasive surgery? Well, um, you know, I really like your attitude of being an advocate for yourself. And what I'll say to you is that, you know, all those questions are excellent. I mean, really, you know, to go through those questions with your doctor, because, you know, we know that with RNS that you can have, you know, over time, and sometimes it can be six to seven years, it has kind of a modulating effect on the brain and seizure reduction can occur. The chances of seizure freedom may not be as high as we, we want them to be at this time, but to continue to work with your doctor, to ask your doctor are, you know, some medication adjustments required while I'm, you know, still having seizures, even though I'm on the RNS, are we, and, and I'm sure your doctor is continuing to program uh, your device uh, or to continue to monitor the seizures. Your the reason that you got an RNS is, is likely because you have more than one area of your brain that was found on studies to be causing the seizures. And sometimes with RNS, the information that we get is, is, is there a more active part of the brain? You know, are, are both parts really active? Uh, with time, actually, some of those things become apparent as well. And just to continue to ask those questions and keep working with your doctor, you know, I, I specialize in everything, but this talk is on the seizure medications. And I, and I want to emphasize to you that, that medication adjustments are certainly, you know, there's, there's no contraindication of medication adjustments when a patient has RNS. And, and really to continue to explore uh, you know, now that you've ha gotten the RNS, what what are the options down the road? And if you you are con you know considering asking your doctor for further testing for resective epilepsy surgery, that would be a discussion you would have to have to see is there a focus that's that's super active? Can the other focus be controlled with medications? There are so many questions, but I'm glad that you have those questions and that you are an advocate for yourself. So continue to work with your doctor. Thank you, Dr. Rashid. I hope that answers uh, the questions. We have another question from Marlu. I'm pretty compliant with my medications, but have trouble getting enough sleep. When I don't sleep regularly, I'm more likely to have a seizure. Is, is this something that has been studied like some other causes? Absolutely. You know, sleep is a big deal for patients with seizures. And, and sometimes patients with seizures don't get good sleep. And sometimes patients without seizures don't get good sleep. So sleep is a huge issue in general. But with our patients with epilepsy, they've got to get a good night's sleep and they have to have, you know, good quality sleep. So when a patient has concerns about not getting enough sleep or not sleeping well and that exacerbating their seizures, I usually have them, you know, we, we discuss sleep hygiene, of course, you know, are you going to bed at the correct time? Are you having any stimulants before bed? And most of the time they're, they're pretty good with that. 
they may need a sleep study. You know, do you have sleep apnea? Is that waking you up? Um, you know, do you have any restless leg syndrome? Is that waking you up? We may discuss that. Um, that the next step would be, would would you be consider would you consider trying a natural agent like melatonin to help you sleep? In some cases, yeah, I tried it. It didn't work. Okay, you want to try a little bit of a higher dose? We can try a higher dose. Um, if, if that works, that's so that would be my first thing. And then the second thing is I've certainly prescribed sleeping uh, aids to patients with seizures. I have a gentleman, he's, he's a, he's a full-time worker. He's a very driven man. If he doesn't sleep, I mean, seriously, you know, so I prescribed him some, some Ambien and, and he's happy. I don't, I'm not getting any more phone calls. So, uh, you know, he's sleeping well on that. And that's important to him because you know, he, he has a full-time job and, and, you know, we have to make sure his seizures are controlled and not sleeping is a trigger for him. So discuss those with your doctor, you know, don't give up, keep, you know, again, just like we keep working with seizures, you know, that's also a process, you know, is, is, is sleep medica medicine or sleep, uh, you know, the, the, you know, etiologies of sleep disruption is, is another field of medic, uh, you know, of, of, of study. So continue to work with your doctor on that. Thank you, Dr. Rashid. Um, and then um, we've got about three minutes left. So I'm gonna try to uh, run through these. My daughter was on Meberol for years, which controlled them for 11 years on her last good stretch. So awesome. Since that was discontinued, we have tried many drugs. She's now on Topamax, Lamictal and Primadone. Since adding primidone, her large tonic seizures are controlled, but she still has simple partial clusters with panic for five days, a couple of times a month. So frustrating. Any th suggestions? Thank you. She is 40. Yeah, I mean, tough situation. You know, again, I think, you know, and I'll just be, give you my honest opinion. I'm, I'm not, you know, trying to, you know, say one medicine is better than another um, here, but just looking at her history and, and that there are things that she's refractory with. I would say talk to your doctor about possibly trying Clobazam or Onfi or Excopri. You know, I think, you know, sometimes adding, adding something like that on may get her, I had a lady who got through her simple partial seizures or her focal seizures without loss of awareness. And she was on three great doses of other drugs. I added a touch of Excopri and those went away. So, you know, same stories with Clobazam. So, the, you know, I'm a little partial because I've seen a lot of good outcomes with, with, with that. But again, just talk to your doctor. Do not give up. Even if a patient doesn't have a convulsive seizure, smaller seizures can devastate them, as, as you know, right? Thank you, Dr. Rashid. And there were a couple of comments um, as of uh, things that... Um, uh, our guests are taking or not taking, as always, you know, check with your physicians. Uh, the one closing remark that I did want to add, and I'm sorry we don't have any time, but uh, we want to be also um, cognitive of the next speaker. But anyways, uh, Kyla Gall just uh, wrote, I just had four years seizure free yesterday, the beginning of Epilepsy Awareness Month. I take Kipra twice a day, I have grand malls. So wonderful, congratulations, Kyla, wonderful. for being seizure free. That's all the ultimate goal, right, Dr. Rashid? Yes, that is our goal always. And, and don't ever give up on that goal. I just wanna tell the patients and their families, don't ever give up on that goal. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Rashid, for your time this morning. We're on the West Coast, so it's still uh, morning with two minutes to go. Uh, we appreciate you you being here and, and giving such a wonderful presentation. Thank you to, to everybody for your wonderful questions and uh, have a wonderful day and, and continue watching these wonderful talks. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.